Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle podcast. Football is back at Meadow Lane this weekend. The first time, believe it or not, in 15 years, Knotts will be playing South End in a league fixture. Now, I'm not too sure how many of us back in 2005 would have thought the next time we would meet would be in the National League. However... There it is. Um, setting the scene for us today. Uh, delighted that Knox's record club scorer, Leslie Brad, is joining us. Afternoon, Les. Well, pleased to be with you again, Paul. Yeah, great. Great to have you on board. And a very warm welcome to a uh, uh, gentleman who's the athletic football correspondent. Used to be one of the big cheeses at Press Association as well. And will be relating a big interview we did with Alan Hardy in the year that we dropped out of the Football League. Um, huge Shrimpers fan. Matt Slater, welcome. Good to have you on board, Matt. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No, no, it's very, it's very good. Very impressive. You've got a much, much better study than me. I just, I just sling up a load of knot shirts. You see, this, it looks this good. Is not to go down memory yeah, lane. Yeah. Too, 1980 to eighty-three, top flight of English football. The you may be too much to remember that, but um, I, no, I do vaguely ago. remember. I could get some South End shirts if you like, but um, yeah, no, I do vaguely remember your your glory years. Yes, that, yeah, yeah, they, they, they were well. They're very much glory years compared to now. Um, if you thought supporting Knox County um, was bad, um, he's following South End even worse. Matt will enlighten us. Two successive relegations, and in the last couple of days, being hit with a transfer embargo in the past couple of days. Knotts bring in Jaden Richardson on loan from Nottingham Forest, and despite our recent results, still only seventh going into this weekend's game. It's becoming more and more condensed by the week at the top. Um, welcome to any and all South End fans who are joining us as well. Um, let, let's pick up first, Matt. Um, South End United, um, an interesting story about why you are a South End fan, yeah? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, I'm um, okay. I'm from Essex. I, I now live in Macclesfield. I, I moved north about a decade or so ago, but I, I'm from Essex. Uh, my home, I was born in Chelmsford, which is the market town, it's the county town, but I, I've lived in, I lived in Brentwood for most of the time now. Uh, Brentwood is famous for being on the M25. Uh, Barry Hearns from Brentwood. Uh, Towie is set in Brentwood. Uh, it's sort of probably closer to West Ham than than South End. It's very much the London end of Essex. I went to school in Romford, which is in the London Borough of Havering. But um, I didn't want to support a West. I didn't want to support West Ham. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be uh, you know dragged into London or, or or Arsenal or Spurs. I wanted to support an Essex team. And you've got kind of two choices there, certainly in terms of league football. It was it was Colchester United or South End. Now, for those that uh, this might be too much geography for your for your uh, audience, but um, southeast geography anyway. Colchester's East Anglia, really. It's pretty close to Suffolk. You're up there with Ipswich and Norwich. It just feels like a very different place. Whereas South End is very much, you know, sort of an overspill of London. It's where it's where lots of the Cockneys moved after the war. And um, I was on that train line. It was all. It was no choice really between Colchester and South End. And the other crucial deciding factor really was that they played on Friday nights, and they played on mm. Friday nights at the time. There was actually two reasons. Uh, I think I've only told you one of them, but the other one is so South End that it's quite funny. Um, well, the same reason that Stockport used to play on Fridays uh, or Tranmere. It, it was because they wanted, you know second teamers to come watch you on Friday and then go watch West Ham or Arsenal or Spurs or Chelsea, whatever it is on, on a Saturday. So that was, that was clever. Now, the other reason was that for, for many, many years, there was a very, very successful car boot sale or, or sort of sort of sale uh, market on, on our car park, which I, which the, the joke used to be that they used to make more money from that than football. I, I don't know if that's, if that was true, but it was certainly a good joke that sounded vaguely plausible. So Friday nights was very much, uh, football. So as soon as I sort of became a teenager, I, I thought, right, well, that's it. I actually want to go to football and I'm not going to be sort of a closet Liverpool fan, which I think I was at the time. Um, and I'm going to support my my local team. And I and I chose South End. And there's another, there was another little thing that was quite nice about South End at the time. Because Danny Greaves, Jimmy Greaves' uh, son, was uh, a former player and was then a coach at South End, we used to get on, because we played on Friday, we used to get on Saint and Greavesy 
they always used to show our goals on Saint and Greavesy. <laughs> so we, so so you know, I got to see live football. I got to see our goals on Saint and Greavesy, and you know, that's it. So that was, I don't know, thirty-five years ago. I th I think if memory serves, Les, you, you tell a good story, don't you? When 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 Jimmy used to take the team down to Southend for a Friday night, and, and didn't some fans come on the on the bus for a fish and chips or something before a game one Friday afternoon, early evening? Well, a couple of stories from from Friday night football at Southend. Um, one was the one that you've just talked about, where we've uh, we've gone down in the coach. Not a lot of money um, in those days, so our pre-match was. Uh, on the front at South End, sat on the coach um, with some tea and toast brought over from a cafe over the road. And when we fi finished, this is, this is in the days of uh, Billy Gray, uh, who was manager 67 to 69. And um, when we'd eaten the um, the toast, there was a group of Knotts fans walking alongside the, um, the, the, the coastline there. And, and Billy went outside, hey, lads, come and get on the coach, come in the warm. And they sat at the back while we're having the team talk. Um, that was one, but there's one a little bit more funnier than that. And it was, I think it was the night when Mick Rose had a, a fantastic game. South ended basically being shooting in for most of the game. And we finished up winning 1-0. And um, in those days, um, the dressing rooms were alongside a bar there, alongside that car park. Um and the players came out the dressing rooms to get on the coach. Jack Wheeler was responsible for making sure all the lads were on the coach. And as we get in, and the store holders were coming in to set up the market for the next day. <laughs> and um, once all the lads were on, then Jimmy used to go and get Jimmy from the boardroom to say, uh, all on, we can go. So um, all the lads were on. Um, Jimmy went off um, to chase after, uh, <laughs> sorry, Jack went off to chase after Jimmy. And went in one door just as Jimmy was coming out the other door. And he got on the coach and said, oh, lads, on, let's go. Off we left without Jack. And the coach went and I think we were heading up towards the motorway. And we would certainly reach London before this car <laughs> and, and, pit, 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 and blocked us from going any further. And, and then Jack got out of it. It was a supporter that had given him a lift. Got you get on the coach and come back. But he wasn't too pleased, I can assure you. <laughs> at least you got at least you got maximum points uh and um fair play matt because we like to have proper fans uh on on these shows you will be at meadow lane with your yeah. youngs on saturday coming along to notch yeah yes absolutely uh the um the east cheshire shrimpers of which there are about four of us uh, <laughs> we, i don't know we've got a flag somewhere i don't know where it is actually though but we'll, we'll be coming yeah we'll be coming there might be some uh some of the um some old mates coming up as well but um yeah, we're, like, we're coming. I've, I've seen somewhere uh, over 600 advanced tickets have already been sold by Southend. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, we, you know, like a lot of teams that drop down a division, we, we we started with such high hopes and we were talking about going to new grounds and wouldn't this be exciting? And um, yeah, look, we, we, we're still enjoying the new grounds. Not obviously, not. Notts County isn't so new. That has been a while, as you've, as yes. you've pointed out. But um, we are still travelling away in numbers. We, we, you know, right from the off, we've been going away in numbers. And I only really go to away games uh, these days um, because I'm sort of so far from, from Essex. But, um, you know, I try I try to get to anything kind of north of Northampton. I sort of think, well, that's kind of doable, an hour and a half or so in the car. So, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Excellent. We, we, you, you hope you will enjoy the hospitality in the Jimmy Cyril stand opposite the main stand. Now, um, when we will come on to South End's woes uh, and um, more shenanigans this week, um, but uh, you did a big interview uh, as knots were in their um, death throes, dropping out of football league would be three years ago now, uh, and you came up to see Alan. Um, just mm -hmm. talk to me about what you made of that interview that day, and and were you one of those people that at the time thought Knox were too big, too good to go down? And kind of when you look back now, what, what do you make of it? Make of that day speaking to Alan and where things are now? Well, um, you're right. I mean, I I have done sort of football finance 
stories off and on. I mean, that's all I kind of do now. Yeah, but you're especially but I mean, the news yeah. kind of correspondent yeah. delving into sort of finances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I've done a little bit around the Munso years, but that that was I didn't do a huge amount. I didn't do anything that any of your fans would sort of go, "Oh wow," you know. I, I was just covering that like everybody else was. It was such a fascinating story, but. The, the Alan Hardy story, you know, that was kind of, I thought that was really interesting. Now, there was a hell of a lot going on, obviously, famous club, famous name. And I could, I knew that things were, were bad. I knew things were bad with his business. And um, this this looked like, a you know, another potential, one of those moments where are we going to lose one of these big clubs eventually? Um, and then, of course, there was the, just shortly before that interview, Alan had sort of become nationally famous mm. for that photo yeah yeah on his um, yeah 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 which i'm sure you've discussed i was gonna say at length that sounds yeah. inappropriate but you, you i'm sure you've you've, you've discussed before yeah. so there were a couple of reasons why Notts county were a national story i was working for the press association at the time and i was their chief sports reporter so it was a national story and i and i i've been following the kind of takeover element to it as well i think i'd even broken a little I, story about someone who was interested in you i can't remember who it was now but there was a bit of a saga to it you know would alan get the club sold yeah. in what state would the club be when it was sold what price were you going to be a efl club or a national league club would there be points deductions? there was all sorts of things up in the air which is very similar to you know berry or derby now or wigan it was that kind of story so um i got i think i got in contact you know i'd like to talk to you i'd like to I'd like to meet you. I've, someone had tipped me off to say that Alan actually is quite a good guy and he will he will talk. You know, he's desperate to sort of explain. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, okay, well, I'll come over. You know, I will come over and sit down. And let's have a chat. And he, you know, and he was as good as good as his word. He said, yeah, come on over. I will show you around and we'll have a we'll have a proper talk. And um, that's kind of what happened. And he, he was, I remember, you know, sort of rocking up that afternoon. Did I meet you outside or? Uh, I can't remember. I met. I met. I met some. Sure. I was introduced to secretary or someone. Let me in. Maybe a cup of tea. I was sort of taken to Alan's office. I think you know, and he he strolled in. He was very friendly, very friendly. And I sort of spent about two hours there, and it was only an hour and a half talking to him, and then a half an hour just having a little walk round. And it, and I remember he was, yeah, you know, he was very proud of the work he'd done behind the scenes. To sort of, I remember his big thing was you know, about his sort of hospitality business. And I know there was the whole thing with his golf club and he was very proud of that. And he wanted to sort of get across that he was trying to make Notts County sustainable, that he was one of these guys who was really thinking, and this is something that I do all the time in my day job. He was really thinking about, okay, how can I monetize what I've got here? How can I make Notts County a sort of 24 seven type business that doesn't rely on handouts or, you know, a wealthy guy to bail them out. And he was talking to me about hotel plans and planning permission and what he was doing at the training ground. And uh, the phase very proud. I remember, did you, did he, did he upgrade your hospitality sort of section and, 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 and the, and the food? What, what, and... Yeah. What, what he did do, um, which largely is, you know, it, it has evaporated because of the loss of league status. Um, was he energised a lot of the fan base with younger fans? You know, we had yeah. introduced fan That's fixtures. Right. So on the one level, he was significantly ramping up the hospitality side of things. Yeah. But inverted commas on the terraces, as we would call it, uh, for those of a certain age, there were there was you know, there was at least one game a season where it was like a pound. That's uh, right. There was a lot of marketing drive. Um, and we got 17,000. Yeah, your gates were good. I, I think I came shortly after a game where the gates were particularly yeah. good. And... So I remember, yeah. Screen, yeah. Which, which, is, which is the way to go. But of course, yeah. the, the huge challenge, and I'm sure this, as a South End fan, um, whatever you do off the pitch basically counts for nothing. Yeah. I mean, exactly. nothing. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. If you don't get results. If you and, that was the, that, and that was the sad, that was, that, you know, that was sort of like the nub of the interview, really. Whilst I was very, you know, keen to hear his story on the work he'd done off the pitch and his his vision for the club, and 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 he was, you know, he was in sales mode, so he was kind of yeah. selling the club to me to, to help the sales process, and I knew that, yeah. and that was fine. But the but the key bits were that it was very 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 obvious, and he he did admit it 
yeah, he did admit it. Now I think about it, that he had got the football wrong, that he'd caught footballitis, that you know he'd come in with a sort of sensible business head. You know, he he'd, he'd, you know he talks a lot about how he sort of saved the club on the door on the on the courtroom steps and all that. I've sort of heard those sort of stories before, and whether they're entirely true or not, it doesn't really matter. He certainly stepped in as a local wealthy guy when the club needed someone like him. And I think there've been sort of some early success, and that's often that's often when it goes wrong. I mean, certainly we can talk about South End as well on this in this regard, where you get close, and then do you go again? Do you change the plan? Do you go for the another player? Do you do you assume that the reason you didn't go up is because you didn't spend enough, and if you'd spent a ton a bit more, you will go up next time? And I think that was a sort of that was that was certainly part of the Alan Hardy story. I think the other thing was that came across was that he. He, was he a director of football? Was he picking the team? Was he picking the players? He couldn't quite decide. Sometimes he'd trust people. Sometimes he wouldn't. He was given some bad advice. Then he'd question that advice. Then he'd question all advice. And I just sort of sensed the guy that 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 just got a bit lost, that, that, that came in with a sort of a plan. I'm going to be a businessman about this and we're going to do this properly. And then got drawn into to areas that he had no expertise in and just just got carried away. He just was a fan, a fan in the boardroom. And this is something that I've seen 30, 40 times, and it keeps me busy, frankly, of, the, of these guys. And then I think the, the, the compounding factor for him, which is why it unraveled so quickly, is that his business went bust. Yeah. And, that's when it, that, and that was the acute problem that he had. Now, often it's a sort of a, a slow process where where owners overstretch themselves get things wrong um but with alan it was it unraveled fast because his was it, was it office outfitting was it sort of an office-based design business yeah was that it? Aragon, yes yeah he, he, right he, 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 effectively what he'd done was use the monies the revenues and the profits from that business to yeah, purchase so. knots and fund knots but yeah. then when his own business needed some of that those funds to be put back in for, for his for his primary business to get through a difficult period. Yeah, the football club had swallowed up all the cash. Yeah, and I think he got he lost sight. He, he, he said he got distracted. You know, yeah. he put someone in charge, and he just he just lost sight of it. But it all unraveled. And um, you know, at the time of the interview, things things he was running out of time, and it was probably I tried to be fair. I always tried to be fair. And he'd been fair with me, and, and he'd answered all my questions. And I think my piece was probably more positive than many of the other pieces that were being written about him at the time. I think they've been a particularly bruising one in the Guardian, actually written by one of my colleagues uh, now. Yes, happens Danny to Taylor. be a Nottingham Forest. Fan. Yes, I know, I know, I know. I'm aware of that. And I and we and I had actually discussed it with him. Uh, you know, he, you know what, what, anyway, we, we had talked about the piece after. after anyway. So I wrote a sort of more balanced piece, I think. Um, yeah. And. Um, you know, I don't need to tell your 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 listeners, how viewers, how things went after that. You know, the club got sold eventually to 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 your current owners, and I thought that was very interesting. I remember sort of reporting on that. Um, there was another, there was at least one other sort of British bid that got quite close. Yeah. That had a big plan around this hotel. It was very much sort of this hotel plan, which I thought was interesting, but it. it it was more it was more complicated than it needed to be whereas the danish guys had the cash and they were they were ready to go so that was that was interesting now i did stay in touch with alan because you know he's a real uh he's a born entrepreneur he's thick-skinned he's, well, he's a weird combination of thin skin and thick skinned he's you know he's he bounced back he sort of he has that american sort of bounce back mm. entrepreneurial spirit and i know that he had a look at shrewsbury town um, yes, I'd heard that. Yeah, yeah. He had a look at another club as well. That I'm, I'm aware of, sort of two or three. Shrewsbury had a he had a he had a proper look at them, uh, and so I had I had reasons to call him about that, and he was very honest about that. Um, I've not spoken to him for a while, but he um, or heard from him for a while, but he, it was it was cordial. And I, I don't think I upset him with my piece. Um, but did I think you were too good to or too big to go down? No, I didn't. No, I really didn't because uh, I think that your league position was 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 pretty tricky at the time mm. and you appear to have just got your squad very badly wrong i think you'd come had you come close to promotion the year before and you just yeah, you, play off yeah play off. but but you know the manager had changed and the squad now. just seemed the squad just didn't seem right um i think you picked up a little bit towards the end of the season but you were you were up against it weren't you 
yeah i mean it, it, in truth i just want to bring les in at this point because because les was kind of on the inside not fully but was we you know within the club gambit um les if you cash the line back um and, and we can get and, and we're going to move on to sort of south end zone plight in a minute but from a from, from a former player someone who is very close to the club on the inside a little bit of that of that club what were those month or two you know the last month or so of football league status dropping out of the league uh, all sorts of worries that the club might go bust completely what's that like to experience well obviously i'm, I'm uh, an ambassador down at the club coming down on match days and those days i was coming down during the week as well morale had dropped terribly um with the staff um, even through to the players as well. Wages weren't getting paid. Uh, don't know about the players, but certainly the staff were missing out. Lifeline stepped in a couple of months. Um, I know um, there were other issues. People were being, you know, sounded out whether they could help with payments. So it, there was a lot of uncertainty running through the club at the time. Um, and... Whilst nobody ever believed that they were going to go down, it's one of those jobs where it's not County, it can't happen. It did happen. Um, and it wasn't a great surprise to me. I was so disappointed with it. Um, but you could sense that, that things weren't right for several months. If you were going to categorise this, Les, and, and I'd be interested in Matt's view on this as well, mm. because clearly you have to large football league clubs, big fan bases, um, never not been in the football league, uh, who both end up dropping out. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate this may or may not be a difficult one for you. And the same question will go to Matt. And I'll chuck my two panneth in as well after you've had your say. Where do you apportion blame for not dropping out of the league? You can percentage your eyes. You can do, 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 do whatever. Where, where do you say that's why we went down who was responsible well i would have to look at the the season before and we finished in the playoffs very unfortunate not to to beat coventry i felt we we had a you know in that second playoff there was a couple of decisions it didn't happen and i think everybody was thinking oh well we haven't um, we haven't made it next year there will be a concerted effort um and then i was astounded what was going on with, with within very quickly we signed the two like the two strikers didn't we at, at, at the time that some heard of for signing players um yeah Kane hemmings and christian dennis yeah they they came in and everybody's going wow and and and, and then other players were coming in and it, it, I wasn't quite sure what was going on. It just didn't seem like the progress of a, of a squad of players that had just missed out to, to probably small tinkering to move on with all of a sudden there was, there was, there was like, it was like major changes were going on. And I think, did we start the season with seven or eight new faces in that team? Yeah. And, and we didn't get off. Off to a good start. We did we draw or lose the first home match? Three first home game. I think it was Colchester. They at the bar. Yeah, that's that's time. right. And, and 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 you know, it just wasn't right. It didn't feel right. And then there was murmurings about another player coming in, another player coming in. Who's signing them? And it, it just the whole thing wasn't quite right. And then the manager gets the sack. Um, before the August is out and then directors are resigning and the whole club was in disarray and it just went on and on and on. Okay. Um, that's, that's a, it's a lovely chronological sequence, Leslie, but with the journalist in me, where do you, <laughs> where, who's responsible? Who's responsible for not going down? Who's go responsible? On, Les, you, have, you have a go. You have a go at that one. Who's responsible where do you put the finger of blame? You can call it what you want. Why did Notts County get relegated? Who was to blame? <laughs> well, what do you, there was several managers, so you can't pinpoint one name there, can you? 
<laughs> there was one owner right the way overseeing that season. Um, ultimately, the, the the top person responsible surely is respond is is the man that. that if, I, I would find it very difficult. Uh, it wasn't being run for me at, through those those early months correctly with whoever it was that was bringing the recruitment. It just didn't feel right. It wasn't right. And this, I could sense that the the players that were in the squad, that it wasn't right. Um, who's responsible for that? You tell me. I'm I, I'm not too familiar. You, you were a director at the time. Boy. You <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, I, I would say I'd be more direct and then we'll see what Matt's got to say about the South End plant. Um, I, I would I would put eighty to ninety percent of the blame on the players. I know Alan is the devil incarnate. Ultimately, he has to take ultimate responsibility because it happened on his watch as chairman. Okay, mm. but I I, I I I I attach the lion's share of the blame to the players because in the same way it was the players who were responsible for getting us into the playoffs. Okay, and playing Coventry now. I think probably 80% of our fan base would turn around and say it's all Alan Hardy's fault that we were relegated. How many people would say it was Alan Hardy's, um, it was all down to Alan Hardy that we got into the playoffs the previous year? We'd say it's down to the manager and the players. So I don't think you can have that mm -hmm. argument both ways. You know, But did, the, the players didn't stop people. trying though, did they, Paul? Say again? The players didn't stop trying though, did they? I, I, if I'm being honest with you, I thought our players were a disgrace in the last year. Did they? Oh, OK, you are saying that then. Well, that's that's interesting. I mean, that, 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 that does happen in certain cases. But... Were, were, were a disgrace. There were, there were large factions within the club. Uh, and clearly, Alan has created an overall climate, yeah, mm. uh, that, that, that was wrong. He made a series of major errors, as, as, as Les is pointing out in the whole recruitment process. The reason not, mm -hmm. in my opinion, got relegated was terrible recruitment. Yeah. That, 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 that That's what it looked like to me. Yeah. Terrible, terrible recruitment. And I think that when you have then got those that group of players, and bear in mind, we had over 30 professionals, senior well, professionals. That was the other thing. You group. seem very bloated. Exactly. You know, you see, <laughs> what do you do with them? You know, because, you know, I was told by Martin O'Neill many years ago, you only ever keep 11 players happy. At a football club at any one time as a manager that's the 11 you've picked because the mm. subs think they should be starting and every and part of the manager's role is to man manage that group isn't it and keep mm. everyone together i thought that our players that season were extre extremely poor but kind of and the reason we're sort of rehashing all this i think matt is because mm. obviously south end have gone through this as well yeah where would you and, and, and we've seen the video uh, with uh, is it Ron Martin? Ron Martin? Yeah, going over to oh the that fans. one, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so where? Wh why was South End relegated? Who do you blame, or who, wh where do you think which relegation responsibility um, lies? Yeah, well, look, I I do. I'm of the school of thought that this is Ron's fault, um, okay. and I'll tell you why. Um. First of all, Ron Martin's been involved in the club for a long time. He 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 came initially as a director, as an investor in the sort of I think late nineties. Um, no 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 previous connection with football or or with the or with the club. He was a business associate of of our of our former owner, um, and it was very clear to me at the time, and even clearer now, that he initially was attracted by property. It was a property play. Now this is this is the South End United story over the last 25 years, over the last 30 years, has been dominated by property, by our ground, by our very protracted move to a new stadium, which was a greenfield site, still is formerly a greenfield site on the edge of town, but it's now because the town has moved to it, is, you know, it's pretty much part of South End. And it's a classic sort of, now this is this, this loads of football clubs have this story where their, their asset is attractive. They have this sort of brownfield sort of site that is, 10 acres in the middle of town and it's desirable and south end is a grow south end's just recently been made a city because of the death of our mp who who, who was desperate to make it's a city but but is a big big town is a big town yeah surprisingly big and is very well connected to london 
So is attractive, is it's property in the area, homes in the area are very valuable. And this is what I think attracted Ron Martin and his mates to the club. Now, it's been tricky. It's been a tr it's very hard building anything, particularly in the southeast. And he's had various ideas, be it casino, a hotel to serve the airport, a massive Sainsbury's. Um, and these ideas have come in and out of fashion. They've been there's been lots of nimbyism. It's been very hard to get things through the council. Uh, the credit crunch didn't help with one of the plans. But it's just been an absolute saga where we are stuck with him and he is stuck with us in many ways. Now, as he's hung around, I think he actually has. And I, I, I talk to club chairman, it's part of my job, right? I talk to club chairman all the time. He was, a, he was on the EFL board for a bit as a club representative. He has become a bit like Alan. He's got drawn in. I do actually now genuinely believe that he supports us and wants us to win. It helps him with his property development, but I think he does care now. He didn't initially, but I think he does. And he, you know, he's been he's been sucked in. And he's starting to behave like a fan. He's been behaving like a fan in the boardroom himself for a while. But never forget that this is the reason he came was about property development. He's a property developer, and he spied an opportunity both at our existing site, Roots Hall, and this new development on the edge of town, which will involve now the current plan, which he actually has got planning permission for. And I think a wealthier, better property developer would actually get this done, would have got this done a while ago. But because he's not an amazing property developer, he hasn't. So we're stuck with him. So, yes, this is his fault. It's his fault because he's been running the club as almost sort of like an offshoot, as a sort of, as a, sort of a property joint venture for far too long. He has infamously used HMRC as a bank. We're talking about we're in transfer embargo at the moment with the National League. We've been in and out of transfer embargoes for as long as I've been a fan. I've been to court with South End as a journalist many times. We have repeatedly, we're probably the worst club for being late with HMRC. He once joked about it, the bank of HMRC. He is a bit of a lovable rogue. Now, at times because we have been up and down the divisions. We've been exciting. There have been lots of promotions. And normally it's been sort of in and out of League One, right? So it's been kind of exciting. But the last few years have been disastrous. Disastrous. He has chopped and changed managers. He's operated without a chief executive for a long time. So again, outsized ego, I know it all. Not working with people, not being collegiate, I'll do it. And then just being sort of a bit of a sucker for, for sort of big name managers and then big name managers who want quick, quick hits. We, we, we have a terrible last few years. If I was to talk about our recruitment, it must be some of the worst in the country. We keep buying injured players. We seem to sort of think the way to get out of whatever division we happen to be in is to buy really good players from that division about three years ago. Guys who got out of the division we were trying to get out of with another team three years before. And not thinking, well, are they fit and are they hungry now? And why are they being released? So that's been our recruitment policy. Now, the funny thing is, and it's, it's actually sort of saved us, is we've actually got quite a good academy. We've got a good patch. You know, Essex is a big populous place. Yeah. You get a lot of London talent that comes out. That sort of kept us afloat. And it's actually quite sad because as we've fallen apart as a business, we've had to, we've had to, release these players way too early and we haven't had top we haven't had the fair return on them but they have at least kept us afloat so i i understand what you're saying about it can be players fault it can be a bad manager's fault it can be bad luck it can be lots of reasons why clubs get relegated but there is a there, there, ron has been there he found where he found us and where he's leaving us if he was to go now would be about two divisions below he found us as a mid-table league one team which is kind of our history Broadly speaking, we've been around for 100 or so years. 60-something of those have been in League One. We've been up a bit. We've been down a bit. But but we, we're sort of a League One club. Pretty boring League One club for most of the time. Now, he's now finding us, if he was to go now, he's now leaving us looking at National League South. We've been pretty much the worst team in England 
for the last three or four years. I was going to just, 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 you know, I'm on my, my high horse now. So Go on, 20, this, this, this in 2017, in, in, tw in 2017, so not that long ago, we came seventh in League One. It was a good year. It was under Phil Brown. We'd come up from League Two, I think, the year or two before. Um, we, had, we had a pretty good team. We missed out on the playoffs by a point. Millwall got got in and went up and have stayed up. Fair play to Millwall. Uh, they actually took our chief executive as well. He's a very good chief executive, Steve Kavanagh. Very well respected in the game. Uh, so we missed out. Just just missed out. Now, the following year, I think we went again with a top half type budget that we probably couldn't afford, which which I think for a club of our size would have almost guaranteed losses, probably losing about a million a month. We don't know because the accounts aren't particularly detailed. And we came 10th. Now, I think that year was when we started to tip into problems. We That's when I started to notice we were chasing it with older players. So Brown went that year. And we brought in uh, Chris Powell, who, 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 a former player who we loved. Yeah, uh, a reputation in the game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now working with the FA. Good guy. And um, he started well. Started well. A lot, lot of goodwill behind him. We had terrible injury problems, terrible injury problems around that time. And I remember January 2019, my, me and my lads saw us beat Bradford away. I think it was 3-0, 4-0. I can't remember. It was a big win. It was fantastic. It was one of the last victories we had that season. We went from 8th, ninth around that time to a relegation fight. So from around that time, we have been in free fall. We, have, we just haven't won many games. We actually managed to beat the drop on the last day that season. We beat Sunderland. Uh, and you sort of thought, well, OK, is that our near miss? Is that our lesson? And the following season just was awful. We would have been, we would have been the worst team in League One the following year. But Bolton, Bolton um, had a big points deduction. We were the worst team. We only finished above them because they, got, they lost points. So we went 19th, 22nd. So second for bottom because Berry got turfed out that year and we should have been bottom. Then then 23rd in League Two. So just crashed straight through. There was no stopping, no turning it around. Burning three managers with Kevin Bond, uh, Mark Molesley, who was a non-league guy who we'd reached out, which I thought was quite a good idea. He'd taken Way uh, Weymouth up a couple of times. And he was, a, you know, a lot of people were talking about it. We gave him no time, really, though. We, we bailed on him. Terrible recruitment. The, the, the club, as I said, was just a bit of a mess. Old players overpaid. Young players being given, having to fill the gaps way too early and struggling. I remember the first game of League Two. I think, was it, was it the first? It was probably, I think it was the first game. We played Harrogate. Harrogate had come up from the National League. And they, yeah. I remember they absolutely bullied us. It was very rare, I think, in sort of professional football where you see a team genuinely battered. I mean, physically. I think we lost four or five nil. It was a horrible game where I just watched our relatively talented, not bad, um, you know, 19, 20 year old players bullied, absolutely bullied by a National League team that had never, you know, they, they, were, they were riding the crest of a wave, but never been in the, it was in the just, playoff final. I know. God. Yeah, and I just thought, oh, my God, we are not stopping. We are not. We, we're going to go through this division. And we did. And now look at us. You know, you think, OK, how many, how many? How many safety nets are we going to crash through? You know, in the National League, you, you have a the relegated teams have a have a one year parachute payment. You have a bit of an advantage there. And you should, at that point, your home crowd should should the fact that you have a bigger budget should start to help. You should you start to think gravity should take over. We should stop falling. We haven't stopped. We started this season with another disastrous squad. All change, but they're not good enough. They are just not good enough. We reached out. We, we, we got desperate. We brought Phil Brown back in at the end of last season. He, he, he had an immediate dead cat bounce sort of new manager thing. And we, 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 you know, we, we weren't as bad as Grimsby. But look at, the, look, what's, look at the difference. Look at the difference. Grimsby started again. They had a change of ownership. They've totally got the National League from the off. They're way better than us, way better than us. Phil Brown, who hadn't seen English football because he'd been working in India for a couple of years, clueless, absolutely clueless. We are we are where we deserve to be. We have been the one of the worst teams in England 
for three or four years. You can hear the passion crackling through, and I'm exactly the same when I talk about Notts County. You're, you're a very high-ranking professional journalist, commensurately professional all the time. I like to think I am in my world. But when we talk about our club, it all comes out, doesn't it? It all comes out. Um, and actually, I think Colin Metcalf has made a very interesting point. He says, it is my belief, and this is with relation to Notts, that the debt HMRC, and I want to come back to you about HMRC in a minute, Matt, and money problems were Alan Hardy's fault. The relegation and results on the pitch were down to players and management. The link between the two was recruitment. And that's, I think that's a pretty succinct summation. Yeah, that works for me. That I think, I, Colin, spot on. That, that is the, definitely the best one we've had so far. Leslie, um, we spoke about bad owners coinciding with relegations. Um, talk to me about the difference in the club now with our current owners? I think they've um, settled... Well, obviously, they came in the club and we didn't have a squad of players. They came in two days before the, the season began, if you remember. Um, I didn't know them. I met them after the first couple of games and they told me what they were trying to do with Notts County. They were trying to establish it as a club... Um, that could run itself. They wanted a squad of players, um, 22 players, two vying for each position. And they wanted them to play football um, in a way that the fans could enjoy. They would, large numbers would come down and watch them. It would be entertaining football. Um, and that's what they've set out to do. They have a business, obviously, as you know, uh, that, collects data on, on, on players from all over the world and um, they've used that and brought players in. Um, some have been very successful, some maybe not quite quite so good. Um, and have we moved on? Um, certainly the group of players that are there now may be, um, I've never seen a group for a number of years that want to, to, to win for each other. Um, the dressing room spirit is, is first class. Um, and for me, most of the games that I've seen this season, we have been the better team. What we need to learn is how to convert that, I won't say superiority, but shall we say um, probably being on the front foot into winning margins, make sure that we win the game. Um, which we've not been able to do consistently. Um, and that comes from not necessarily being, um, how, or shall we say, having abundant skills. It comes from a little bit more about desire to get the game won, which we saw, I saw on Sunday night watching Chesterfield. I wasn't overly impressed with their style, technique, but they weren't going to let the opposition have a, a shot at goal without trying to get a block on it. And they were going to put pressure on the opposition's defence when chances might come. And they finished up winning the game 2-0. And I think if we can just bring some of that, of those qualities into it, into our team, then we, we will have um, a very, very good team that can go and win home and away. Um, one thing, because I think Matt's mentioned this on a couple of occasions already about successful business people used to being successful, getting sucked in less emotion, passion. I think one thing that Alexander and Christoph absolutely don't do, they don't micromanage the club, do they? They're not at the club a great deal. They don't jump up and down and punch the air. They're, they're quite dispassionate people, which is, which is more unusual than not these days with chairman and owners? Well, I sit um, not too far away from them in the director's box watching the home games and their emotions don't rub quite as high as mine, and rightly so, but they are very, very determined guys. They, they, they want us to win. Um, they want us to be successful. I don't think... I don't know how they talk with the manager away from the football match um, and, and, and the backroom team. Um, 
but there, there, there is a, um, a group now, a football group, where um, methods are discussed, uh, tactics are discussed, um, and they want the club. They're very determined that the club will be successful and get promotion, whether it's this year moving forward. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if they put that pressure on the manager. I, I'm not privy to that information, but I do like the way the club has been run. OK, Matt, let, 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 let's just focus back on Southend. Um, where, where are the fans right now? So are is it a toxic environment? Is it a one-off, the video that we saw? What, what's the mood of the fans? Well, we're, we're, see, we're talking about a really interesting time. So the mood has been getting steadily worse, as you could imagine, as, you know, as, as the results have got worse, uh, and have really started to turn against Ron Martin in the last year to six months um, and, 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 and now. And, and we, we, <sighs> that, that flares up every now and then. It, it flared up beginning of this season there are a couple of of, of, of pitch invasions that, um, that that were picked up nationally you saw the video where he tried to talk to away fans at a game that went really badly I mean he, he, he and he's had a, a also this this hasn't made national news but he's tried some video calls as well with fans groups where he's just got into slanging matches um, and, and he's a he's a strange chap uh, he's, he's quite arrogant um, and he, but he does this sort of thing. He tries to be engaging every now and then, and then he can't seem to understand why fans are angry with him. And so he's, he's not, he's not, he's not particularly savvy. I don't think. Um, so things have been getting worse, but what, but what I will to give him some credit, he is, he is thick skinned. You know, I said, you know, I wondered if Alan was and, and Ron Martin really I, is. Um, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, you do have to say that he has, been paying the bills late uh and has got us into various scrapes but he you know he has run the club it's his club you know it's it he owns us um and uh you know we haven't gone bust we haven't gone into administration um you know so i'll, I'll, I'll give him some credit and you know certainly in those years a few years ago we were trying to get out of league one i think it was i think he was hoping it would help with the stadium I think you could then sort of force it through. You know, look, we're a championship club. We need this bigger home. Come on, South End Council, give us the home so I can build my houses and I can get out of here. So there was there was that. Where we're at right now, right now as we talk, is that it was confirmed today that we're under a new embargo. Now, I've actually been aware of this for a while. I, I know uh, all journalists would claim to know stuff. It was actually broken by the, the, the by a very good local reporter, Chris Phillips, who, who covers the club for the South End Echo. I got tipped off by this a few weeks ago in confidence, and I didn't reveal the story because, one, I, I agreed to not to do it, and I was also I was also kind of asked that look, things are changing. Give give Ron a chance. Now, what he's done this season is that he has actually appointed a chief executive, a good a South End fan who was working at Gillingham, Tom Lawrence, who is is highly thought of again within within sort of EFL circles, and 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 appears to be doing a good job. So, despite our relegation, we did really well with season tickets. We did well with our sort of sponsors. What you sort know, of crowds are getting at the minute? What sort of crowd? Well, not bad. I mean, we sold, I think, sort of 3,100, 200, something like that, uh, season tickets. We've been getting 5,000, 5,000, 6,000 at home, and we've been taking a lot away. So that's not bad when we've been as bad as we are, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, the, the the support has been loyal. Yeah. Surprisingly loyal. Bounce as well, isn't there? Having not yeah. Been yeah, no, that's that's a fair that's a fair point, yeah. Um, so it did look like there was a bit of, there was quite a lot of optimism this summer, it was like, okay, well, look, we appeared to have recruited well in that we recruited early. We've since discovered we recruited completely the wrong people. And and sort of getting Phil Brown to stay was sort of spun as a positive. Well, Phil could go, but he stayed because he's just, you know, he, he thinks he can get us back up. Now, it, as I said, it just hasn't panned out that way. So there was there was an element of optimism, cautious optimism at the beginning of the year. It just dissipated really fast when the results went. Now, we've now learned that we are under embargo. Now, this is bad for a few reasons. One, because no one wants to be under embargo. But in the last month or so, as people might be aware, Stan Collymore, who's a former player of ours, he didn't play for us for very long. 
but but we love him because he was great for us. He was absolutely fantastic for us. And we sold him to Nottingham Forest and we did very well out of that. And then we did really well when he went from Forest to Liverpool. Sell and on, there yeah. are, you know, because we had a, a sell-on clause. So he is a sort of much-loved former player. He's always, he kind of likes us because we sort of rescued him from the Crystal Palace reserves. And and it's where, it's where his career took off. And he's, you know, just off, you know, just behind the scenes. He, I know he's a controversial figure. I, I know he is and isn't everyone's cup of tea. But he's always been good in things like, you know, turning up for uh, charity matches or, yeah. or or signing stuff for former employees and things like that. Yeah. I've heard good things, right? So he has taken a real interest in the club. And when things were going absolutely pear-shaped with these demonstrations, you know, Ron out and us in danger, I think, of of getting points deductions and being, you know, behind closed doors and all that. It was getting quite bad. He said, okay, look, I'm going to, I'm going to help one appoint a new manager. So I'm going to work with Tom Lawrence, the chief exec. I've got lots of contacts in the game. I'm going to open up my contacts book for the club. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And there was this sort of, you know, three, four week period, but you know, would he have a role? Was he, was he trying to be manager himself? He assured us he wasn't. Did he want to be director of football? He's kind of got this sort of roving community type role. Um, and, a few good things happen. One, we got rid of, we, we sat Phil Brown and we appointed a much loved former player called Kev Mayer, yeah. who probably should have had the job about two years ago, by the way. He worked in our academy. Again, our academy is quite good. He had to go to, to, to Bristol Rovers to, to sort of further his coaching career and was number two there. Very highly thought of, played sort of 400 games for us, was really good, was in that team that won League One a few years ago and, and, and did okay in the championship. A really, really good player. Uh, and, and and apparently a very good coach. And uh, so he's our manager. He's He's got nothing to work with because we now know we're under embargo. He's made us better. The results haven't massively changed. We, we've had a couple of wins. We, we're starting to beat the bad teams. Though we drew last night, which was very bad. Um, against bad Maidenhead. Yeah. We were one nil up and it was a grim game. I didn't watch it, but I hear it's grim. Um, and that was, that was a blow. We sort of need to beat these bad teams. So we're not... We, he's made us a bit better, but not. He hasn't changed everything. Um, the we've got Mark Bentley, who is is number two, who's former Canvey boss, um, so knows non-league. And we've just also appointed slightly unusually, given that we're under embargo, as a sort of head of football, John Still, who who calls Dagenham and Redbridge, and, Dagenham, Luton, yeah, 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 Luton knows knows you know, but certainly has a reputation for spotting a player. You know, has is, is well known within the game that if you're operating under a budget, he's the sort of guy you'd like because he can spot a gem in National League South or even lower. Or it's so, slightly so, younger Barry Fry, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's when we've been good. When South End have been good, we have been. It's because we've given people second chances. We've 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 turned Collie Moores around or, or, or Freddie Eastwoods or these sorts of guys. We've had Freddie Eastwood. These, yeah. yeah, you know, guy a guy Freddie. bombed out of West Ham, went to Grays. You know, we, that that's that's the sort of player that, that we've got behind, that we've loved. So so I think there was a sort of sense that maybe Collie Moore's ability to get guys in from loan on loan and the two best players we probably have at the moment are two guys from Sheffield United who just managed to get in before our embargo probably uh two Sheffield United players that aren't that aren't bad but but are due to go back um and, and we haven't got much else to be honest but um but we do have this sort of brain trust in place now we've now learned they they they've been twiddling their thumbs they've they've been unable to bring players in because once again we owe HMRC 200 grand now this is this is very worrying because Ron Martin right now, and, and we didn't really even know this until about two months ago, is facing tax fraud charges for a property development over in Gloucestershire that has been off and on for the last few years. He's facing criminal charges. So uh, th this, is the, this is the lunacy of it. The day after, I think this was, I don't remember if this was early November or late October, the day after South End Council renewed and gave you know gave green light for this great big property development at roots hall and the go-ahead for this new round and, and again housing and retail development on the edge of town a place called Fossett's farm the day after he was in court over a million pound fraud a multi-million pound fraud 
and it, and and we're still not paying our tax bill. This is this is where we're at. So I just checked my phone. The South End Supporters Trust, of which I'm a lifetime member, <laughs> have just called for him to go. He's not he's not fit and proper. Now they now they've sat on the fence. I mean, the other fan groups have been a bit annoyed that the trust have been too patient. This is this is it. This is the last straw. So that's this is the club that's coming to see. It's coming to play you on Saturday. A club where the fan base is furious. Very interesting. Um, Les, um, what? I mean, what, one thing I think for, 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 from Matt's there, that, and you use the same phrase, and I and I think an awful lot of this comes back. You mentioned recruitment, you know, and and recruitment is is for me the single most important thing. And I think, as as one of our followers mentioned, it's kind of the bridge between the, the owner and the structure that he creates, because if he puts the right structure in to recruit. Yeah, the chances are if you get the right players in with a half decent manager, you you're certainly going to be halfway rather than at the bottom end, because if you re if you recruit badly, by and large, you spend money. If you recruit badly, you can't get rid of the players. And this, of course, was one of the huge challenges that Knox faced with a very bloated squad when they went down. But we, Matt, um, have quite an unusual recruitment structure. We're very um, data led people liken it to a, a national league version um of brentford mm -hmm. um les um we've brought a lad in from forest on loan uh this week uh i believe there might be some others can't say too much at the minute um how have you been with our recruitment in the past six 12 months you think we're getting it right a lot of younger players looking to improve them potential resale values I think, yeah i think since these owners have, have have been here there's been no rush signings um you know when neil ardley was manager uh, i'm sure discussions took place on where improvements in the squad needed to be made and um the 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 um the data business kicked in from there and came up with um, a list of names that could help and it moved on in in that direction so the manager or the um, head coach were involved in in the decision making. Um, you hear stories about um, players being bought in that maybe the managers don't, don't know about. I'm, I'm saying this might be happening at Southend as well. I don't know, but you hear too many stories of of, of, of that taking place. And if that is um, taking place, then you, you you've certainly got problems if if, if the manager's not. Um, fully aware of who, who's coming in, who's going out. Um, definitely. Um, one thing I want to pick up on that, because obviously this is kind of your forte, and uh, two things. Uh, and, and I can't, I, I don't know whether you can give me an answer, but I, I struggle to understand. So over the past 10 years, there's probably been 20, 30, 40 clubs that have been under transfer embargoes for a variety of reasons. You know, I think we've certainly had one or two under Ray True. Uh, Forrest had them. Um, and in most of these cases, it trickles out from another club telling somebody else who mm. passes it on. And so we know aware that Southend are under an embargo. So my first question to you, why don't the leagues, the National League, the Football League, the FA, whoever is responsible for these, why shouldn't these be published and and made totally transparent to us as fans? Because all the other clubs know anyway. So you, you're not telling me you're losing a competitive advantage because all the other clubs know that that Club A, Club B, Club C is under an embargo anyway. So you, I don't see yeah. how it can be deemed to be financially sensitive. What we're talking about is clubs are embarrassed. Mm. But for me, it's a case of a league should be leading. And on the day South End are put into an embargo, it, there should be a press release going out from the National League or from the Football League. You're right. Now, to be fair, the English Football League has started to publish this stuff. They don't send press releases out. We could all go now have a look at the English Football League website, and if you if you 
navigate through it, you will find a list of all the clubs under embargo. And there's actually quite a few at the moment because one of the um, conditions of taking one of those EFL COVID loans to pay back taxes is that you are under an embargo. So that's so that so to be fair, that's a relatively recent thing that the EFL have started to do, and it's all part of their commitment to transparency. So another thing that they didn't used to do, no, but they do now, and this is the last two years, really since Rick Parry took over, really since Berry. So Berry and Bolton yeah. were big shocks to the system. Yeah. And all the clubs basically said, We want you to apply your rule book. This is mm. the problem, right? The rule book's not bad, it's just you're not applying it. You're not applying it consistently. You're applying it too late. So let's start applying the rule book. Let's start holding clubs to to it. And let's be transparent about it. So the EFL have taken all that on board and are doing much better. So the other thing they're doing is they are publishing the results and the written reasons from all their disciplinary cases. So you can read Sheffield Wednesday, Reading, Macclesfield, Derby, you can all read them. You can read the reasons why they got dot points. And they're there. They're in you know, those 60, 70 page legal documents if you want to read them. So the EFL are doing that. And the National League aren't. And I guess it's for the same old reasons that the EFL didn't used to either. There is this sense they don't want to embarrass the clubs. The clubs don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to admit this stuff to their fans because it it sends out that message that we are in trouble. And the minute the clubs are in trouble, fans start to lose heart and they might not come. So I think that's why that's been, I think the main reason why they have never, well, they didn't used to publish and reveal who was under embargo. They never used to, they never used to, used to ring them up and say, as a journalist, it's so-and-so under embargo. We don't, we don't talk about embargoes. And it would be up to the club themselves to admit. And they would often, they'd often only do it when the fans have been shouting at them for so long. Why aren't we buying players? You said you were going to buy a player. It's three days to go of the transfer window. Why haven't we done it? They might then say, well, actually, sorry, we've been under embargo. Okay. And the other thing is, of course, is the other, that many fans, I think, have sort of misunderstood about embargoes over the years is there are different types of embargoes. There are, there are really hard ones, like, like you are, that's it. You know, we are very There's worried about you. to communicate the le- the embargo yeah. and the level of it, so yeah. everybody understands. Yeah, exactly. You know, some it's sort of one in one out. There's some that can almost negotiate. It's it's not even one in one out. It'll be it'll be a, it'll be a number. It'll be okay. Well, you've got this much room. They they have always there's always been an element of give and take to them and negotiation to them with the EFL. Um, but you're right. All that stuff should be communicated. And that, to be fair, as I say to the EFL, not only are they listing the clubs that are under embargo, they'll list the reasons why. Okay. So it could Mark be. Ives. It could be. Yeah. Mark Ives National League, get your finger out, and let's yeah. be, yeah. Let, let's let, let's adopt similar practices to the EFL. Point two of the question, which cropped up many times, uh, HMRC. Um, how? How is it allowable? How is it constantly repeated that football clubs rack up such huge, huge, huge sums of money while they are in financial difficulties? And I'm thinking Derby. I know you've broke several stories at Derby, and I know one or two of the ins and outs at Derby as well. But what tends to happen in these cases is HMRC, I don't want to say I want to stick up for him, but, you know, we pay taxes for a reason. Um, it, 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 they're, they're kind of emotionally blackmailed. So at the minute, the administrators at Derby and everybody else is emotionally blackmailing HMRC to wipe out. Oh, you've got to wipe out. Uh, what, what's the figure? Is it 60 mil? What's the figure? Well, that, the, the tax bit is 29, nearly 30 mil. Okay. So t- okay. 29 million pounds. Now, how on earth is it allowable that Derby can rack that size of debt up. Because if because if, it, if, it, if that debt is much, much smaller, administration will, will happen a lot sooner. It embarrasses the current owner. There's a far better chance of the club coming out of administration. All you're doing mm-hmm. is just kicking the can down the road. Yeah. How, how, do, how are clubs able to, to rack up such huge levels of debt to HMRC? Yeah. Look, there's a few things to to 
perhaps to say here. So, so in the past, there were kind of two main taxes we're talking about: VAT and, yeah. and then the payroll taxes. So PAYE and, and, and national insurance. And um, so South End and, and Ron Martin is the is the master of this. It has been basically playing games of brinksmanship with the tax man for for years. So he just waits until the very last minute to pay. So he'll deduct payroll taxes from his staff and players. Okay, they won't. They they'll think they've paid the taxes, but the club is not passing it on until often HMRC has tried to wind us up. He knows that they'll always get. You know, you can you can pay sort of at, at the courtroom, or they'll often give you another thirty five days, forty two days to pay. He does it because he knows he can get away with it. Exactly. Alan Hardy exactly. did it. Ray True did it. Lots of them have done it. Now they all do it. They all now, do what's, it. Now, what was supposed to happen, and other countries have learned this lesson better than we have, you know, France, Spain, other countries where they've had business failures, is they were supposed to be much quicker, you know, almost kind of like this traffic light warning system, you know, right, hold on a minute, you're in arrears of tax. That's an immediate embargo. It could be a points penalty. In France, they relegate you. They don't mess around with 12 points. They relegate you. In Belgium, they could take your license away from you. So other other countries have got onto this much 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 quicker and and more um, you know dramatically than we have, but by and large there has been I think a movement within English football to be hotter on this to to, to yeah. not let clubs uh, get into arrears on tax. Now unfortunately COVID came along, and right lots of small medium sized businesses yeah. were effectively given time to pay they were basically given tax win tax holidays and that is basically what a lot of efl clubs have done okay. in the same way that the sole traders did you know and what we're seeing now is the sort of as we're unraveling from that 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 lockdown period well-run businesses well-run football clubs are, do, are, are making time to pay deals with hmrc so i i owe you seven eight million pounds because i didn't pass on eight you know paye for a season okay can i pay you over the next two three years and hmrc are by and large saying yes you're good for that okay as long as you meet your payments you and i are not going to have a problem derby there's a problem because the, the bill's got too big mel morris the owner there has said i'm not paying over to you administrator sort this out hoping i think that they'd be able to rinse 75 percent of that debt which is yeah. what we've seen from so many administrations before where hmrc would just go in with all the unsecured creditors and have to take 25p in the pound now what's changed in the last couple of years is hmrc have, re have regained preferential status within insolvencies now that hasn't been tested yet in a football administration yeah that is why derby are in trouble it's because HMRC back. have regained this status, which means they they think they're higher up the queue, higher up the the pyramid for for repayment of assets, and they're not going to give it up at the very first opportunity. They're not going to let that precedent be set. So they want it all. So there'll be no there'll be no rinsing of seventy five percent. That's what that's what the administrators of the Derby are trying to negotiate right now. Yeah. Interesting. Right. You've got to be out of the Manchester United very shortly, Matt. Yeah. Uh, let's, yeah, yeah. let's get back to Saturday. Um, amazing how tight at the top it is, you know, isn't it? You know, the good news is it's four points, is it, for us to Chesterfield? Um, despite, you know, we've played well this season. We're still seventh. I mean, it's, it's, it's brutally cutthroat in that top end of the table for the one spot, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, there should be discussions going on with the league about two automatic promotions from the National League. Um, we'll try not to delay it. Matt any further. Matt will pick up on that in a minute. Keep going. No, yeah. I 100% agree. 100% yeah. agree. Right. Keep um, going, guys. The, the, the quality of football in the National League, I think the time we entered it, you, we've seen the, it progress massively. Um you know, clubs coming in with owners who who, who want success and they're, they're structuring the clubs differently, like league clubs. Um, and, and I'm sure it's going to come down that road, definitely. Um, we, 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 we are in, I think, Notts County now, our, a football club that's been well run. Um, 
wages are being paid on time. I think bills are being paid on time. And that's a massive plus in this day and age. You've just been mm -hmm. talking about all the issues going on with clubs. You know, South End, unfortunately, have gone through all of this or going through all of this. You know, Derby County just up the road. It's a mess and it just needs putting a stop on it somewhere and, 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 and moving forward again because it's just got totally out of hand. Things have happened that shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Um, let's thank you, Les. Let's just wrap up with Matt. And 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 clearly, you are um, in direct contact with a lot of the movers and shakers in football. Uh, Rick Parry, I think we both agree, is doing a very good job at the EFL. I think Rick Rick Parry's a good guy. Um, one of the things that clearly and quite rightly people can say, well, you're only advocating this because you're now in the national league, and there's an element of that clearly. But do you foresee a time when the football league would be amenable to making changing the number of promotion places with particular reference i guess we're talking here about two up and then one in a playoff yeah but my, my counter argument to that is it's turkish voting for christmas i don't see it i think there's a massive argument and i think there's a massive campaign the national league can wage for this because they're getting big crowds and all the rest of it do you think it's possible i do I do actually, and um, because I've got, Rick, I've got Rick Parry coming on my podcast tomorrow, but I don't want to. Oh, that. We, yeah. <laughs> it's a great line in. Give yeah. us the plug. I didn't genuinely I know. know yeah, that. yeah. We have the okay. business of sport. We've got, right. we've got an hour okay. of Rick, Go which we recorded today. Um, now, look, the we don't actually get into this particular subject. It's all about the fan led review, Tracy Crouch, and redistribution yes. of money, but it, but it is connected. So, what I think has happened in my lifetime particularly in the last sort of decade, is that it's not 92 clubs anymore, is it? It's 110, 120. You know, that for how many, you know, the full-time, I think, is it all but two in the National League of full-time? Yeah. It's about 90, 95%. Yeah, the yeah. And there's a couple There's a couple at the top of, you know, North and South who are, are pretty close as well. Your car, so, Dorping are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's remarkable. I think it's wonderful. You know, the National League has, has done a, blinding job of becoming uh, a sort of finishing school for for, for ambitious non-league clubs that, that that are ready for League Two. Absolutely ready. I mean, you can see that. They're not coming down anymore. Those clubs are not coming straight back down. They're staying. They're going, look, look, look where Luton are. Yeah. Well, look, look at Sutton, who we all thought would be yeah. automatic candidates to I finish know. bottom. I know. So look, so that's it. And, you know, there's the old arguments that there was this massive gap. That's gone. Everyone knew. Everyone knew that gone. Yeah. That's why they got to the second place. And I and I'm now. I sort of knew this already because I've been seeing. I've been watching a bit of National League football before Southend came down. The the top half of the National League, I think, are better than the bottom half of League Two. So maybe the top ten, the top ten of the National League yeah. are better than the bottom ten of League Two. If you just think about it, because those clubs are all they're all they're all failing, they're all they're all tired. Whereas the National League is so competitive at the top, there is a bit there's a bit of a chasm within the National League. I think we're at the wrong half yes, of it. it. Um, but so at the top half of the National League, there's some good good players there, and it's become I think really obvious in the last few years with you going down. Uh, obviously, the big takeover at Wrexham, the money at Stockport, the budget at Chesterfield, you know, Yeovil, Grimsby. You know, there's a lot of good, good clubs, really good, who, who would beat League Two teams over two legs. So that's, I think, just the quality argument's gone. And then you come down to, OK, Turkey's voting for Christmas. Now, this is where I think things might move. Go on. The EFL have got this big argument going on with the Premier League, Right. We're asking you to redistribute more. Well, the EFL can't be selfish themselves. They have to look downwards too, because there is now at least 20 odd teams below them who are League Two ready. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to start to see not so much a conversation around the 92 or the 72, as more about our pyramid being 100, 110, 120. And if we're going to start talking about, as the EFL want to do, putting all TV rights in the same pot and we start to sort of do a 75-25 split of yeah. the entire pot, so EFL and Premier League together. Let's put the National League pot in there as well. Let's start thinking about a 75-25 with the 25 actually going and flowing further down than League Two. 
let's really let's really sort of if we care about the pyramid don't just stop at the 72 because there's a, there's some really good clubs just just below you who are proving to be as the minute they get promoted to be great league two and league one and championship clubs because they're all going in the right direction so I, you know, I, th- I think it is possible. I think some there are some issues around things like the artificial pitches. I think mm-hmm. we might get some movement there. Um, so I don't think it's as unlikely as you might think. I think it's sort of thing that could be forced on the EFL a little bit. I mean, if, if a regulator comes in, they might, they might say, well, look, guys, I'm not seeing a great deal of difference between League Two and the National League. Let's have three up, three down, between between every division. If you if you think it's important enough as a principle between the Premier League and and the Championship, yeah. Then why isn't it important between League Two and the National League? I'm going to send a tape of this to Mark Ives. You've just done his little pitch, haven't you? You've just done his little pitch there. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting, Matt. I know you've got to be places. Yeah, to I've got. I have actually got to go. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but I have enjoyed talking to you guys. We will retweet your um, business. Football podcast. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Oh, it's tomorrow. Uh, with thank you very much for joining us. Um, um, enjoy our hospitality. On I'll Saturday. say hi. Are you are you, are you at the game? I'll, I'll yes. Say hi. Yeah, you'll, right. you'll see me there. Give us a shout when you get there. I, I, I like all to right. go on and get in early. Watch the watch how they warm up and all that sort of thing. Um, so I'll come over and see you. Uh, Can we have a point? Can we? I'll settle for a point now. Can we have a point? No, <laughs> we need three less, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, top end with only one up. I tell you, I you know, need 90 I points know. this year. Why you ain't going up? Why she, not automatically. Oh, dear. Well, okay. Uh, we'll just have to win our home games then. Oh, well. Yeah, well, All I should right, look to coming down to Roots Hall. Uh, okay. It'll probably be exactly the same as you remember it in the 70s, won't it, Les? Yeah, it hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah. Well, we hope never, you get never that. spent a penny on it. Hey, well, yeah. we hope you get that new stadium. Um, <laughs> thank you. Enjoy Meadow Lane. Les, thank you ever so much. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Thank, thank you. Very much Thank you for listening and watching, and we'll be back next week. Take care for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.